I was old enough to <laughs> in, instinctually understand that I couldn't use any of my brain to absorb this. That it was that it was su such a devastating waste of time on Earth. All right, man crush. Well, you pick up a point, and we're heading into our final one point round. You have control of the board. What category are we going with next? All right, so I I'm gonna play a little bit of uh, yeah, just because I don't know where Bren's gonna go with this. I'm gonna go music with a one point round. All right. All right, so let's go May 4th, 1999. And here is one of the most annoying and overplayed songs of 1999. And it's all rooted to an abysmal flop of a movie. Uh, little story here. So there was a producer named John Peters. And all John ever wanted out of life was a giant spider in a movie. He failed to get that giant spider in the aborted Nicolas Cage Superman movie, but he never gave up hope. And at the same time, you had Will Smith. And Will was like the creme de la creme of Hollywood at the time. Basically, anything Will did turned to gold. Fresh Prince, Bad Boys, Independence Day, Men in Black. Massive, massive hits. Then he turns down the role of Neo in The Matrix and signs on to do this giant spider flick that I'm talking about. So, and matter of fact, Will Smith would call this the worst decision of his career. His own mother was quoted as saying, Will, you could have done better. All right. So keep in <laughs> mind, they've been planning this movie for quite a while, like several years, probably like most of the decade, because most of the, like the Western movies that were popular in the 90s came out in the early 90s. So basically every big named actor in Hollywood was associated with this movie at one point or another. You had Tom Cruise, Mel Gibson, Matthew McConaughey, Johnny Depp, George Clooney, and they all declined to do this movie or they went on to do other projects. All these dudes, they thought it was going to be a flop. Mel Gibson went and said, fuck this. I'm doing Maverick. Tom Cruise said, fuck this. I'm doing Mission Impossible. Johnny Depp said, fuck this. I'm going to do Donnie Brasco. And yet Will Smith turned down the matrix to do wild, wild West. Okay. And last week I spoke about Stallone. All right. We talked about Stallone and he won all those Razzies over the years for worst actor. Well, this movie, it swept the 2000 Razzies with five wins and four nominations. Worst picture, worst screen couple, which is Will Smith and Kevin Klein, worst director, Barry Sonnenfeld, worst screenplay. And finally to tie it all together with my musical selection, worst original song, Will Smith, wild wild west and honestly look a song for a movie should help right i mean we just you guys had teenage dirtbag and that, that made me want to see loser when i saw the video this track by will smith made me never want to see wild wild west <laughs> something that i would not even do until a few years ago and that was only because i was sick and the remote was across the room and i fucking just suffered and watched this piece of shit Somehow, though, this track right here, it would go number one on the Billboard Hot 100. It managed to get certified gold in the process. But much like the movie, this song would win the 1999 Golden Raspberry Awards for Worst Original Song. So that's twice this song won Worst Original Song. How can they be wrong? Uh, side note, like if you ever actually make it through this entire movie, just do me a favor. Turn off the movie after the giant spider scene or you're gonna end up hearing wild wild west and it'll be stuck in your head for two weeks it's science okay so we got <laughs> will smith and the atrocity that was wild wild west whether that be the movie or the song or anything with ww in it in 1999 all shit because of will smith thanks that's what i got horrible <laughs> All right, Joe Finley, what did you bring for the music round? All right, well, my uh, picks, well, my pick has actually covers two consecutive weeks in 1979, uh, the week of May 12th and the week of May 19th. Oh, showing off a nice drink there. I'll show off mine. Actually, no, they're not paying, so I will. I'm showing by a mistake. Uh, forget it. Uh, 
Anyways, so in a year that had a ton of big things going on in music, Prince's first single, The Clash's first American tour, Ozzy Osbourne being fired from Black Sabbath, The Cure's first album, and a wedding jam session that featured three of the Beatles, Mick Jagger and Eric Clapton, all at Eric Clapton's wedding. Uh, I have some bad news for you. It was also the, the time period where disco held eight of the top 10 spots in the Billboard Hot 100 for two straight weeks. This was kind of their last gasp of uh, popularity until about two months, almost to the day when the infamous uh, Disco Demolition Night happened in Chicago, which uh, was kind of the informal beginning of the end of disco. Uh, but in those weeks, so eight of the top 10 in both weeks had were all disco acts. Among them were uh, Donna Summer, The Village People, The Bee Gees, Sister Sledge, Cher. Uh, there was a lot going on. There was a uh, there was a Jackson's song in there that was very disco-y. Uh, it was just something to read through this year. And every time we do uh, any music stuff, and you hit the '70s, we always hit that rock. Like the '70s is the just the real birth of this kind of rock. We're always bringing up Van Halen, Led Zeppelin, The Who, what have you. And then to have all these cool things happening specifically in this year to have May be dominated by disco is just the worst. So that is my pick. Disco taking over the charts for two weeks of May in 1979. That's not the end of it, though. Because I've had 77 and 78 before. Mm -hmm. They had a good, probably three or four year chunk. Yeah, they did. But this was right at the end up. where it was like everybody thought it was kind of over. But then a bunch of albums came out and they all did huge again. It's horrible. Right? Yeah. Well, it, it made its way into wedding culture by then. So it was too late. <laughs> It's All no right, Wild Wild West, but... <laughs> right, you know. All right, so my music selection for Worst Of is kind of a good-for-me, bad-for-you situation. Because any time on our Facebook page that I post an album with from this band with a bunch of other albums, we get hundreds of comments, and without a doubt, we always get five or six that say, any but this band. Uh, it's one of those bands that it's kind of like blue cheese and olives. Either you like them or they completely detest you. And the ones who really like them, oh, they, they really like them. So I have for you a self-release debut album that was only available on cassette. And, and it was sold at shows until its official release on May 8th, 1989, recorded at the Euphoria Sound Studios in Revere, Massachusetts from engineer Gordon Hook a loop. This album was uh, would get its a wide CD release in 1992 by Elektra, where they would actually add three added bonus tracks because of the extra space that would the CD would accommodate. The album would go on to sell over 500,000 copies, a surprising feat since most of this band's fans' dispo disposable income is spent on overpriced concert tickets and nitrous oxide. I give you the debut of Fish with Junta. Uh, the title of the band, the title of the album Junta is actually a tribute to the band's first manager, Ben Junta Hunter. Uh, Fish had a release party for Junta on May 9th, 1989 at the Front Club in their native Burlington, Vermont. They played a bunch of cuts from the album that night, as well as some great covers such as Frank Zappa's Peaches and Regalia, ZZ Top's LaGrange, Whipping Prost from the Allman Brothers, and Bold as Love from the great Jimi Hendrix. So you look down the, uh, the track listing here for Junta. You got Fee, You Enjoy Myself, Esther, Golgi Apparatus, Foam, Dinner in a Movie, Divided Sky, David Bowie, Fluffhead, Fl uh, Fluff's Travels, and Contact. Now, most of these tracks would remain staples in the band's set list to this very day. So it's the debut of Fish, May 8th, 1989. That's what I got for the worst of music kind of wow. a beauty in the eye of the beholder here i yeah i cannot i like when you said fish i didn't believe it because like you listen to them 
I, I know I'm a huge fish fan, but every time I post it, I get hammered. And then if you like them, you like them. If you don't, you can't stand them. So much so that at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the first early memes I saw said, if you could cure COVID by sacrificing one band's fan base, <laughs> which band would it be and why fish? <laughs> Great. You just got us banned off YouTube. Appreciate yeah. That. <laughs> well, this, this is, uh, this is hard. This is like, real. you guys, I mean, well, first of all, I'm a fish fan. Okay, right like straight up, like uh, uh, there's there's no album I don't like. But when I was in college in the University of Scranton, Pennsylvania, from 1991 to 1995, I hated them. I couldn't stand them at all because of the type of people who were trying to convince me that they were great. Not and I was into like hardcore. I was into the Pixies. I was into Fugazi. I was into Quicksand and Helmet. So I just wanted nothing to do with this like you know Grateful Dead barf like stuff <laughs> but uh i graduated and two years later uh the story of the ghost came out which was produced yep. by one of my favorite producers andy wallace yep. he doesn't produce a lot of records he mixes a lot of records if you look up his discography you'll see it's just about every hard rock song that you've ever loved in the last 25 or 30 years um and the odd production credit for this record and I was, I've just, so I discovered Fish late, on their late, later records in the late 90s on my own and was sold and went back and got into them. I've seen them live. Trey Anastasio is fantastic. They're all great. So that's really tough. I love Golgi Apparatus. It's one of my favorite Fish songs. Um, my favorite of all time is Gaiuti, which is, uh, yeah. uh, uh, they outdid themselves. It's beyond Masterpiece. And I've seen them do it live and they pulled it off. So it's like... Nice. It's a high wire act that um, is very risky, no matter how good you are. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, now, getting back to the 70s for a moment here. Um, I can't hate disco because it primed the pump for uh, Highway to Hell, which came out in 1979, and then Back in Black on the heels of it to just like, you know, take disco down like a sickle you know like it was over it, it, it they whatever they did in detroit um whatever the charts were saying uh, i was acdc who killed um uh who killed the beast and and the, and that was was done with these two records back to back uh highway to hell and back back in black so um i can't really despise disco i also the first band i ever saw live when I was about seven was Sha Na Na. And at the time, coming off of the Grease soundtrack and everything, they were kind of like tamper, you know, like playing with disco a little bit. They were even like in a, in disco suits and the, the fashion. It was 50s doo-wop stuff, but it was being discoized. So I didn't see the harm in it at the time as a naive sort of seven-year-old who was like excited to see Bowser and, and you know, just the gold suits and everything. So I, I can't hate on disco um, for those reasons. Uh, let me tell you what I know about Wild Wild West. <laughs> <laughs> I was old enough to in instinctually understand that I couldn't use any of my brain to absorb this. That it was that it was su such a devastating waste of time on Earth that I, and I'm a huge Will Smith. Fan. I love Will Smith. Okay, him and Brad Pitt. Whatever they're in, I'll watch it. This thing and that weird movie where he ages backwards, Brad Pitt, uh, Will Smith failed me here, but he failed everybody. And I don't really think it was his fault because to be fair, if you read somebody the script to The Matrix in 1997 when they were developing it or with the Wachowski brothers, would you get it? Yeah. Would you really like? I Funny story. And I think I told them this on the show before I went the opening weekend and I don't know. I, we came from the bar and went to see the movie. And I didn't get it. And I was like, what the fuck? I and I had to see a second it. time. Second time, I was like, oh, this is fucking amazing. But the first time, I was like, what? So, so I had I, to I explain agree. it to my friends. Right. So so it, it, it's pretty revolutionary. It became very popular very fast. But at the time, 
when he wakes up in the pod and he's like the things are coming out of his arm it was like what just happened like where what <laughs> right a little bit now a little bit you know I have a high tolerance for weird sci-fi, so I made my way through it. But something about Wild Wild West, and it might have been the song, it might have been the video, but all I have in my neural network of that song is one single snapshot of Will Smith doing this. That's it. <laughs> Nothing else. It's all a blank. And I don't know anything about it. You told me more about it in this <sighs> description than I have ever known. And I kind of, I'm going to work hard to make sure that it goes right out of my brain and leaves room <laughs> for more important things. So, I I have to say that it was it was definitely Wild Wild West that that failed us all. Yeah, I think so. I yeah. we I think we all have to agree with Will Smith's mom on that one. Yeah, he could have done better. Listen to your mother, kids. This <laughs> yeah, she. I mean, he should have asked her like, "What do you think? Read these scripts." Maybe she would have also picked Wild Wild West because, like you said, Matrix was a little trippy, like. But again, like, ah, it's so bad. So, it's such a shit movie. I don't get it. No, it's not the other robot movie. Like, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Just trash. Yeah. Like, the, even the combination, like, I love Kevin Klein too, but like the combination of the two is it's oil and vinegar. Like, they just don't, they don't go together. It's weird. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And there's Terrible. a lot of weird, like, you know, the, the Southern racial stuff that was going on just had no place yeah. in this fun quirky because i uh kenneth brown See, stop is just telling always me making... about it stop <laughs> telling me about it like, no. i've got my copy of the script right here <laughs> interior you have, this, you have the selma hayek doing absolutely <laughs> nothing in the movie except being there it's it's bad <laughs>